So this is actually a, a question of the time. Um, as you know, that for several years, uh, the classic paradigm had been that patients with acute ischemic stroke who meet the criteria for intravenous thrombolysis receive intravenous thrombolysis. And then subsequently, if they meet the criteria for mechanical thrombectomy, they undergo thrombectomy. However, it's also been recognized that mechanical thrombectomy is the main way of achieving recanalization and reestablishing re blood flow to the ischemic region of the brain. And it's becoming questionable whether intravenous thrombolysis contributed anything beyond what mechanical thrombectomy could not achieve by itself. And obviously, uh, there is a cost issue with intravenous thrombolysis, and there is also a risk issue so obviously the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage after the treatment may be higher if patients have received intravenous thrombolysis in addition to receiving mechanical thrombectomy. Now, the other side of the story is that um, if mechanical thrombectomy can be provided in a time-efficient manner, then probably that is the best way to do it. However, in many places, particularly in the United States, where the care paradigm requires patients to present in one hospital, receive intravenous thrombolysis, and then be transferred to a comprehensive stroke center, there is a certain amount of time that is elapsed in these transfers, and perhaps instead of having no treatment, intravenous thrombolysis may still be of value. So now we have four randomized clinical trials um, uh, that actually showed that in patients who actually are randomized to intravenous thrombolysis with mechanical thrombectomy versus those who receive thrombectomy without receiving any intravenous thrombolysis, the outcomes are the same. The rate of functional independent is no different. However, uh, the field is changing. So while on one hand you have that evidence that exists right now, which would support that in places where treatment can be provided expediently, mechanical thrombectomy can be done in a time-efficient manner, intravenous thrombolysis may not be necessary. However, the field is changing, and one of the things to recognize is that intravenous thrombolysis is also changing. So the classic intravenous thrombolysis used to be with alteplase, and now there is the third-generation thrombolytic tenecteplase. And there's already evidence coming in that patients who get intravenous tenecteplase and get mechanical thrombectomy do better than patients who get intravenous alteplase and get mechanical thrombectomy. So as the use of intravenous tenecteplase is increasing all over the world, including United States, the group that received intravenous thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy may not be the same, and they may already be achieving a better functional independence or better outcomes in terms of functional independence. So we have to account for that change. And the most recent trial uh, the direct save actually allowed patients to get intravenous tenecteplase if that was the institutional standard of care. And what you see is the group that receives intravenous thrombolysis, which could be intravenous tenecteplase, and that mechanical thrombectomy appear to do better than the group that actually achieved or was randomized to mechanical thrombectomy alone. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is the trial design. Almost all these trials were designed to be non-inferiority trial. And the non-inferiority margin, meaning that the difference, uh, the magnitude of difference that would actually allow you to conclude that one treatment is not inferior to the other, non, or actually is equivalent to the other, is very important where you define that margin. And these trials have used very large margins. So you'd have to have a very large difference between the two groups, intravenous thrombolysis with mechanical thrombectomy versus mechanical thrombectomy alone to say that, well, they are not equivalent. And perhaps the many, many imp or clinically important difference may be much smaller. So I think that there is some design issues, perhaps in the interest of recruiting less patients, uh, but nonetheless, the precision of estimate or the confidence about the findings of the study, you know, also uh, are of uh, less rigor. So that's kind of where we are right now uh, with intravenous thrombolysis before mechanical thrombectomy. I think it's also important to mention that the guidelines, almost all the guidelines, particularly the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines, still emphasize that intravenous thrombolysis be given 
in any patient who's a candidate for intravenous thrombolysis prior to mechanical thrombectomy. And after the results of the direct safe trial, it appears unlikely that those guidelines will change. And uh, the current standard will still remain intravenous thrombolysis before mechanical thrombectomy. I think that change will be prompted if intravenous tenecteplase one is more widely available and it's a trial that actually compares intravenous tenecteplase with mechanical thrombectomy with mechanical thrombectomy alone and equivalence is demonstrated with a clinical trial design that actually has enough precision of estimate and the findings can be or one can be very confident about the findings themselves based on the statistical design only then i think um, the practice paradigm will actually change uh, i do think that is also a cost issue that we need to be aware of that intravenous thrombolysis followed by thrombectomy actually is more expensive than mechanical thrombectomy alone so in the event that both are actually equivalent i think that mechanical thrombectomy alone may be the way to go or maybe the most cost efficient way to go forward